me the Honorable Minister of um, Communications and Data Economy, who presented three very exciting memos today, and uh, he would brief you about his memo. I was standing for the Minister of Works and Housing, who wants to make a trip to the airport now on the two uh, memos that he presented. So it's my pleasure to please, you know, yield the microphone to my brother, the Honorable Minister of uh, Communications. Information and Culture, my elder brother, Alhajilai Muhammad. Ladies and gentlemen of uh, the press, my colleagues from the digital economy sector, good afternoon to all of you. And uh, may peace, mercy, and blessings be upon you. As earlier mentioned by the Minister of Information and Culture, I had the privilege of presenting three memos before the Federal Executive Council today, and I will follow them sequentially. Memo number one is National DIC-1 policy. The policy aims to institutionalize providing docks during construction in Nigeria at federal, state, and even local government. This is the global best practice today. Before construction, even during the conceptualization, design, and construction, there should be provision of docks for road construction, bridges, rail lines, seaports, and any important building. Today, we are being confronted with a challenge that whenever we want to provide telecommunications infrastructure in some cities and towns in Nigeria, a lot of damage is being done either to our roads or to our facilities. Why? Because during the design and construction, no provision of any dock or pipeline where the fiber optics and other telecommunication gadgets will pass through. It is because of this we organized stakeholder engagement, where we brought all the stakeholders, including the Ministry of uh, Works and Housing, where we all agreed that there was a need to institutionalize the provision of docks in design and construction. And there are so many benefits to be attained from that. Number one, it allows shared infrastructure. Number two, it makes maintenance and repair much, much easier. If that is part of the design and construction, during maintenance, you don't need to damage any road or any important building. That provision is sufficient, and you will have a chamber where you will get access to all the facilities. It is because of this we came up with this policy. In addition to that, it will also continue to make the price of our broadband cheaper. However, it is very cheap in Nigeria. As of uh, August 2019, based on the official report of the Nigerian Communications Commission, one gigabyte of data, the price approximately was 1,200. But today, the average price is 350 naira. So if you look at it, the reduction is even more than 60%. So, but by doing that, because uh, fi laying fiber optics, um, a lot is being spent in doing that. When we try to reduce the price and the amount being spent in doing that, that is part of the cost of production. So it will automatically bring the cost of production lower. And by implication, all of us will get even broadband access at more affordable price than what is being obtained today. And uh, we had many stakeholder engagements. We engage over 37 institutions of government, and now the policy has been approved. So by implication, during road construction, bridges, rail lines, sea forts, stadium, and all other important buildings, we should make provision of docks where at least any wire or any gadget for electricity or telecommunications or any service that is required will make use of that facility and lay their cables. Uh, policy number two is national child online protection policy and strategy. 
As we all know, there are many benefits of going online. The world population reached 10 billion on the 15 November 2022. Today we have around 6.3 million pe billion people online. And by implication, among this number, you will discover many are children. They will not be able to differentiate what is beneficial and what is harmful. According to the report of uh, the International Telecommunication Union, even during COVID-19, more than one billion children were online, most of them for their studies, because schools were shut down. So they switched only to virtual learning. Children will not be able to differentiate what is beneficial and what is harmful. And today, without any soliciting, if you go online, you will discover that many things are coming into your device unsolicitedly. And if you are at least matured, you will be able to avoid. But children could not be able to. And that will definitely affect their innocence and will even affect them morally and otherwise. It is because of this that uh, the International Telecommunication Union, which is an, uh, an arm of the United Nations, came up with a policy document for all its member countries, 193, and Nigeria is part and parcel of the International Telecommunication Union. The document has been titled, Keeping Children Safe in the Digital Environment, the Importance of a Protection Under Empowerment. In this document, all member countries have been urged to ensure they come up with a policy where children are going to be protected. In the UK today, they have a bill that is online safety. Many countries are working on a similar document. It is because of this, we organize stakeholder engagement where we invited around 37 institutions of government because if you look at the challenge, it's not only one sector, but rather it is multi-sectoral issue. Ministry of Information and Culture National Broadcasting Commission, for example, National Orientation Agency, all of them have a role to play. Security institutions have a role to play. Ministry of Justice has a role to play when it comes to differentiating what is legal and what is illegal. What is fake and what is real, information and culture has a role to play. When it comes to crime, Office of the National Security Advisor and other security institutions have a role to play. So the implementation requires multi-sectoral approach. It is because of this, the memo and the policy has been approved. And part of its implementation, there is going to be a governance structure where relevant institutions of government will come together and ensure its implementation, including private sector and relevant civil society organizations. So this also has been approved. Prior to that, we leverage on our existing laws to come up with the policy like Cyber Crime Act 2015. There is a provision of protecting all citizens and children are part and parcel of our citizens. Also, we have Child's Rights Act 2003. And there is also a provision of protecting and ensuring the safety of our online content in other legislations. And uh, finally, uh, in our National Cyber Security Policy 2021, there is also a provision in which the Nigerian Communications Commission has been mandated to come up with a policy to protect our children while online. This policy has also been approved. And the third one, it is a bill. That is the Nigeria Data Protection Bill. As you all know that in January 2019, the National Information Technology Development Agency came up with a subsidiary law, leveraging on its mandate and power as in Section 6, Article A of NIDDA Act 2007, the subsidiary law has been entitled as Nigeria Data Protection Regulation. The wisdom behind coming up with this regulation is to ensure the privacy and confidentiality of our data 
that we are submitting to government and other private institutions. Confidentiality of our data and security of our data is key to whatever we do. In some cases, you will discover that some institutions are abusing the data of citizens they collect. Some they will even advertise data online. Some they even commercialize without the knowledge of our citizens. At that time, the National Information Technology Development Agency, leveraging on Section 6 of NIDA Act 2007, came up with a subsidiary legislation or subsidiary law. That law has been enforced by the Commission. And we did so at the time that the uh, European countries collectively came up with their general data protection regulation. That is the EU data protection regulation. And it becomes even part and parcel of uh, the global best practice in security, in economy, in whatever your country does with other countries. To the extent that today, potential investors usually ask questions. When you invite them to invest in your country, they will say, do you have any data protection law in place? So that they will ensure data to be collected is going to be protected. It's important also to our security. That subsidiary legislation is being enforced. In February 2022, His Excellency President Muhammad Buhari has approved the establishment of uh, the Nigeria Data Protection Bureau, and he also approved the appointment of uh, Dr. Vincent Olatunji, the then director of e-government in NIDA, to be the national commissioner. After enforcing the law, we also discover there is need for the integration of the subsidiary legislation into a principal legislation. We must have a principal law in place. In Nigeria, subsidiary legislation could be as powerful as the principal legislation, or it could be as powerful near to the principal legislation, because it is being considered up to the Supreme Court as a law, as long as the rulemaking process is respected. However, when dealing with international communities, some of them do not recognize your subsidiary law as a law. You must have a principal law that will go to the National Assembly. It is because of this, with the support of the Office of the Minister of uh, Justice and other stakeholders, we integrated the subsidiary legislation by addressing some observations that uh, have to do with lacuna and certain vacuums. And it has been presented today before the Federal Executive Council, and it has also been approved and the Attorney General and the Minister of Justice has been directed to transmit the bill to the National Assembly. Most importantly, data protection and privacy is part of our Constitution of Nigeria 1999 as amended, particularly Section 37, that our citizens, their data must be protected. That will improve the trust between government and citizens on one hand, and it will also improve the trust between government and potential investors in the other. So these are some of the reasons why we came up with these three important documents, and all of them have been approved by the Federal Executive Council. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Uh, I think after listening to those exciting uh, memos, uh, mine is not very exciting. One of the memos that he presented, which was approved, was for an approval for the revised estimated total cost of uh, contract uh, augmentation for the construction of uh, Mayam, Ushongo, Lizel, Katayo, Tse, Agboregba, Oju, Ajila Road in uh, Benu State. Uh, this, the contract for this road was actually awarded first in 2012 uh, due to whatever reason it is still not completed and of course if a contract was awarded in 2012 the and 10 years later you expect the contractor to ask for you know augmentation 
and that's what happened today, and it was approved. The second memo, which was which he presented, which was approved, actually has to do with the headquarters, the Mabush headquarters of the Ministry of Works. Um, sorry, I, I think I didn't give you the figure of the the original contract was um, uh, one um, billion and thirty-five million. Uh, it's now been augmented with an additional one billion and sixty-three million. So bringing the total to two billion ninety-nine million seven hundred eight thousand four forty-six naira. Uh, the other, con uh, the other um, memo that was approved for the minister actually has to do with the uh, Mabushi headquarters of the Ministry of Works and Housing. Uh, I'm sure it's no longer news that the Mabushi headquarters of the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing uh, does not. Uh, depend or rely on the national grid for its uh, power. Uh, they rely on their solar grid, and uh, the contract, uh, the memo today was uh, <clears throat> to to seek approval uh, for the estimated total cost of um, of the contract for the design and installation of solar power plus microgrid system and energy you know, retrofitting of the ministry. Um, but sometimes in 2019, I came in, uh, a contract was awarded, yes, in March uh, 2019, for the provision of a solar power that would power the entire ministry. Uh, it was awarded at a cost of uh, then uh, uh, of about um, um, two billion seven twenty-one thousand, and now they are seeking for an uh, augmentation of three o nine million to bring the total cost to three billion. The reason for the augmentation is that in the process of uh, executing the project, certain works which were not anticipated before are to be taken into consideration. And in addition, this augmentation also includes, you know, I think, a maintenance contract for, uh, you know, by, by the <coughs> maintenance contract of the um, installation. So this was, again, was approved. But I think the important thing is that you can see that we're diversifying our source of energy, and this is clean energy. And uh, any ministry that, I think the honorable minister threw, you know, threw an invitation to any ministry that wants also to go solar, that they will provide you know, the advice for them. Thank you very much.